Good morning. At this time, will sergeants please start their recordings? PC recording has started. Recording to the cloud, all set. Thank you. Back, back up is rolling. Thank you. And good morning. And welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addictions, jointly with veterans. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, chairs. We are ready to begin. Good morning, everyone. I'm council member Farrah Lewis, chair of the Committee on Mental Health Disabilities and Addiction, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our joint oversight hearing on mental health services for veterans in response to COVID-19 and alternative treatments for post-traumatic stress disorder. I'd also like to thank my co-chair of the Committee on Veterans, Council Member Eric Dinowitz, for holding this important hearing with me today. Today we're here because we know our veterans have very distinct health issues related to their military service and are far more likely to experience trauma related injuries and behavioral health challenges than people who never served in armed forces. In 2008, a study conducted by the RAND Center for Military Health Policy Research found that roughly one in five veterans experience a mental health condition. And we also know that veterans have been deployed to the wars in Iraq and in Afghanistan are more likely to experience mental health conditions or cognitive injuries. The psychological toll of multiple deployments and prolonged exposure to difficult threats can be, an un can be understated. It is estimated that among New York veterans of wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, nearly 8,000 suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, also known as PTSD. More than 7,000 suffer from traumatic brain injury, also known as TBI, and more than 4,000 suffer from both. Unlike physical wounds, mental health conditions affect mood and behaviors and often remain invisible to friends, family, and other service personnel. Sadly, our veterans may also face significant barriers to accessing treatment. From, for some, overcoming the stigma of asking for help is often met with logistical problems that make access the, uh, make, sorry, excuse me, make accessing the appropriate treatment options with, within the appropriate behavioral health systems difficult to obtain. In 2005, Thrive NYC announced two initiatives designed to reach the city's veterans and pledge to invest and expand the veteran services outreach team and create a veterans holistic treatment fund to provide grants to community-based organizations that utilize evidence-based restorative practices. In, 2000, in November 2009, DVS and Thrive NYC announced that they would be scaling up their veterans mental health programs through the launch of the following six initiatives. Increasing mental health providers of Vet Connect NYC, grants to legal service organizations to help veterans upgrade their discharge status, training for mental health prof professionals, support for holistic treatments, and funding for a peer support program for veterans with PTSD as well as coordinating efforts with the Federal Interagency Mental Health Task Force. To date, we still have many questions about the DVS and Thrive NYC partnership and hope to learn more about it and its funding and programmatic activities. Additionally, we hope to get a status update on the Vet Check program, which provides supportive calls and referrals to veterans and their families. Today, we also look forward to hearing more about alternative treatment approaches and therapies such as MDMA and psilocybin that have shown great potential for use in treatment resistant mental health conditions. For example, a recent study found that psilocybin improves symptoms of depression just as well as established metrics and have fewer side effects than a conventional antidepressant. 
Additionally, a recent study on MDMA therapy for individuals with severe PTSD reported that 67% of participants who received MDMA no longer qualified for a diagnosis of PTSD two months after treatment, which is phenomenal. Finally, today, we are also hearing introduction number 2442 sponsored by council member Diana Ayala in relation to establishing an office of community mental health. At today's hearing, the committees look forward to hearing from the administration along with providers, community-based organizations and advocates about, the, about how New York City can provide more effective mental health services for our veteran population. I wanna thank the administration New York City Department of Veteran Services, the Office of Community Mental Health, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and the Office of, sorry, it's those three, who are here with us today. I know you are committed to working on this issue and to effectively address the mental health needs that arise in our veteran communities around the city, and we look forward to hearing from you. I also want to thank my colleagues, as well as my staff, Legislative Director Christia Winter, as well as council committee staff, senior counsel, Sarah Liss, legislative policy analyst, Chris, Christy Dreyer, and financial analyst, Lauren Hunt, for making today's hearing possible. And now I will turn to my co-chair, council member, Eric Dinowitz, for his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Lewis. Um, my name is Eric Dinowitz, chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Veterans. I want to thank all of you for attending today's joint hearing with the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities and Addictions to discuss mental health services for veterans in response to COVID-19 and alternative treatments for post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. I also want to acknowledge our service members, veterans and military families who've joined us today and take this opportunity to share my gratitude for their immeasurable sacrifices as we celebrate National Veterans and Military Families Month. One way we can thank our service members is not just with the words and thank our veterans and their families, it's by ensuring that they have access to quality health care and mental health services. It is well known that service members and veterans face a higher risk of trauma related injuries and mental health challenges than people who have never served in the military. The primary mental health conditions resulting from recent military experiences include post traumatic stress disorder, depression and traumatic brain injury. These conditions are commonly referred to as the invisible wounds of military service, which can cause as much pain and suffering as physical injuries sustained during combat. Estimates based on data collected by the RAND Corporation show that among New York State's veterans and their families, nearly one quarter, 22% of veterans surveyed had a probable diagnosis of PTSD and or major depression. 34% of those surveys in, surveyed indicated they had a need but did not receive treatment. Many cited common barriers to receiving treatment, including persistent stigma surrounding mental health issues and difficulty navigating the services and benefits available to them. Local government must ensure that there is sufficient outreach to connect our veterans with care coordinators who can educate them about their treatment options and help them navigate the healthcare system. The same study also found that 46% of veterans with a mental health need would prefer to receive mental health services outside the VA system. This demonstrates that public and community-based healthcare play a vital role in integrating our service members and veterans back into civilian life. This is why we must make every effort to connect our veterans with culturally competent healthcare providers who offer innovative and effective treatments to address their unique needs. The administration and the city council share a common goal to, to connect New York City's veterans with high quality mental health care they need and deserve. I believe we can only succeed if we strengthen interagency collaboration across the three agencies here today. It is our duty as a city to help our service members, veterans, and their families access quality health care and supportive services they need upon their return home. Um, I, I don't, I, I want to acknowledge the, the presence of council members, Ambry Samuel, Micelle, and Riley. And I also want to thank uh, the Veterans Committee staff for their help in putting this hearing together. Committee Council, Bianca Vitali, Policy Analysis, Elizabeth Arts, Senior Finance Analyst, Sebastian Bacci, as well as my staff, Jenna Klaus, 
Mike Corbett, and Sabrina Campbell. And now we'll turn it over to today's moderator, Bianca Vitale. Thank you, Chair Lewis. My name is Bianca Vitale, and I am counsel to the Committee on Veterans for the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. At today's hearing, the first panelist to give testimony will be representatives from the administration, followed by council member questions, and then members of the public will testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise Zoom, excuse me, should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. I will now call on the members of the administration to testify. Testimony will be pro provided by James Hendon, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Veterans Services, Susan Herman, Senior Advisor to the Mayor and Director of the Mayor's Office of Community Mental Health. Additionally, the following members of the administration will also be available for answering questions after testimony is provided. Lamari Espinal, Assistant Commissioner of Community Affairs for the New York City Department of Veterans Services. Jason Lochran, Executive Director of Special Pro Projects for the New York City Department of Veterans Services. Jamie Nichols, Acting Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Mental Health at Department of Health and Hygiene. You have the same kind of plug for me, right? You're just plugging right in here? Yeah. Good deal. Okay, good. Nicole Torres, Senior Director of Government Engagement and Special Projects at the Mayor's Office of Community Mental Health, and Sean Redding, Communications Director at the Mayor's Office of Community and Mental Health. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Hendon? I do. Director Herman? I do. Assistant Commissioner Espinal? I do. Executive Director Lochran? I do. Assistant Commissioner Nichols? I do. Director Redding? I guess we'll get back to him if he jumps on the call. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Hendon, you may begin when ready. Commissioner Hendon's on mute. All right. Thank you so much, Bianca. Before I begin, I just want to say that our Director of Grants Administration, Ellen Greeley, will take this seat after me and she'll take the oath also and she'll be a part of the Q&A after I give remarks. Just want to say that. So, first off, good morning, uh, Chair Genowitz, Chair Lewis, committee members and advocates. My name is James Hendon and I'm proud to serve as Commissioner for the New York City Department of Veterans Services. I'm joined today by Jamie Neffles, Acting Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Mental Health at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and Susan Herman, Senior Advisor to the Mayor and Director of Community Mental Health, who will be testifying on Intro 442. I welcome this opportunity to testify about mental health services for veterans in response to COVID-19 and alternative treatments for post-traumatic stress disorder. The coronavirus outbreak exacerbated existing mental health needs as well as creating new ones for many New Yorkers making it more important than ever to stay connected to one's community. This time has also increased citywide rates of food insecurity, unemployment, social isolation, and the need for housing, medical, and benefit assistance. Mission Vet Check was created in collaboration with the Mayor's Office of Thrive NYC, now called the Mayor's Office of Community Mental Health, and was designed to offer New York City's veterans support and connection to the veteran community during this crisis as well as immediate information about essential public services, including free meals, COVID-19 test site location, vaccination information, and health resources. Veterans were also referred to DVS for additional resources and support, such as housing, benefits, a healthcare need. VetCheck trained volunteers from New York City's veteran community to make compassionate check-in calls to other veterans. Training was delivered by DVS and the Mayor's Office of Five NYC, and volunteer management was overseen and conducted by New York Care. Volunteers were also offered supplemental training resources through PsychArmor, an organization that provides military-specific training. 
The New York National Guard helped pilot the initiative by making over 4,000 calls to city veterans. Almost a quarter of the veterans whom volunteers were able to speak with were referred to services. The most common service requests have been for food assistance, unemployment, information of COVID testing and care questions. Since the launch of Mission Vet Check in May of 2020, we have facilitated over 34,000 total calls with an approximate 25% answer rate, resulting in over 100 calls per week. Of those answered calls, DVS is proud to have been able to serve the over 1,200 requests for service since launching. These requests range from food assistance, eviction prevention, mental health benefits, navigation, and more. Additionally, with support from the Mayor's Office of Community Mental Health, DVS began the implementation of two health assessments known as the Patient Health Questionnaire 9 and the Generalized Anxiety Disorder 7 to screen our clients for depression and anxiety. Since February of 2021, DVS staff have conducted over 220 health assessments for which 49 indicated severe anxiety or depression. In that eight month period, DVS has made 95 referrals for mental health services. This is three times the number of referrals compared to the period before the implementation of the health screeners. Further enhancing DVS's ability to identify mental health needs of our clients more accurately and connect them quickly to resources. DVS have also made suicide prevention among service members, veterans, and their families a top priority through collaboration. DVS has been the beneficiary of trainings by experts with the U.S. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs to help develop a network of military, culturally competent, community-based organizations able to tackle the challenges of servicing returning warriors and veterans coping with physical and emotional distress. DVS worked with the Mayor's Office of Community Mental Health to establish crisis intercept mapping teams in Staten Island and Queens to strengthen the delivery of evidence-based suicide prevention policies and practices for uh, service members, veterans, and their families during the period surrounding an episode of acute care when the risk of suicide is higher. These teams comprise the community and veteran medical centers, behavioral health providers, social service organizations, and New York City agencies. Following the formal training sessions, these teams have evolved into virtual learning communities in which best practices in crisis care have been more intensely explored with subject matter experts focusing on the benefit of asking the question whether their clients have ever served in the armed forces, reserves, or National Guard, peer-to-peer -peer connectedness, suicide prevention screening, and lethal weapons safety planning, gambling addiction among veterans, and most importantly, recently, the impact of the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Afghanistan, what that has had on our veterans and a related initiative to reduce suicides among service members transitioning from active duty to veteran status. DVS is supporting the National Department of Defense and Veterans Affairs endorsed exploration of terminal ser service sponsors program by identifying community-based organizations which can assist in recruiting and managing veteran and civilian sponsors willing to ease the reintegration of returning warriors to their hometown or new residential communities in New York City. We have been successful in enlisting the Staten Island Participating Provider System as a lead agency for this network and continue our efforts in, to, to reach out to other suitable organizations. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and Veterans Crisis Line nine-digit telephone number will be replaced by the three-digit 988 in July of 2022. And planning for this rollout, the New, York State, the, New, the New York State Office of Mental Health has formed several working groups to assist in the implementation and expansion of mental health crisis call centers. DVS has joined the community education and marketing, marketing working group to ensure that appropriate messaging is crafted and effectively disseminated to the military and veteran communities. In conclusion, we thank you for the opportunity to testify on this matter and look forward to any questions you or other committee members may have. Thank you, Commissioner Hendon. Director Herman, you may begin when ready. Good morning, Chair Lewis, Chair Dinowitz, and members of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction, and the Committee on Veterans. My name is Susan Herman, and I am a senior advisor to the mayor and director of the Mayor's Office of Community Mental Health. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of Intro 2442. Long before the COVID-19 pandemic, mental illness was common in New York City. Every year, one in five New Yorkers experiences mental illness, and hundreds of thousands of them are not connected to care. Over nearly two years of loss, uncertainty, and trauma, 
the pandemic has exacerbated pre-existing mental health needs and created new ones. These years have also highlighted deep historical structural inequities. New Yorkers of color are more likely to experience mental health needs than white New Yorkers, yet less likely to get the care they need. These profound needs and persistent disparities demand an all government approach to mental health and sustained leadership from the highest levels of city government. That is why earlier this year, Mayor de Blasio signed Executive Order 68 to establish the Mayor's Office of Community Mental Health or OCMH. Our office builds on the vision of Thrive NYC, which represented the first time a large American city dedicated its own funding, not just state and federal funds, to support the mental health of people who had long been underserved. Today, the Mayor's Office of Community Mental Health partners with dozens of city agencies and nearly 200 community-based organizations to promote mental health for all New Yorkers. With the wide ranging mental health impact of the COVID-19 pandemic likely to linger for years to come, the work of our office is more important than ever. Accordingly, the city strongly supports intro 2442, which amends the city's charter to codify an office of community mental health. To demonstrate the value such an office brings to our city, I would like to describe the core functions of the Mayor's Office of Community Mental Health. We work in two distinct ways. First, we close gaps in mental health care through innovative approaches. Second, we provide strategic policy guidance and interagency coordination to maximize the promotion of mental health across city, agent, city government. I would like to share some of the remarkable progress we've made over the last few years progress that is having a measurable impact on the lives of New Yorkers. OCMH oversees initiatives implemented by city agencies and community-based partners, all designed to close gaps in mental health care. These initiatives supplement and enhance the pre-existing mental health care system. They were never intended to replace it. Our focus on closing gaps in care has led to new or enhanced mental health services in many locations, including shelters, schools, family justice centers, senior centers, residences and drop-in centers for runaway and homeless youth, and mobile services that can reach New Yorkers wherever they are. In a city our size, it's especially important to test innovative solutions so we know what to bring to scale. Our office provides programmatic oversight we assess program performance, meet regularly with agencies to discuss progress, troubleshoot obstacles, and refine our approach when appropriate. Reach and impact data for each of our programs is publicly available in a user-friendly data dashboard on our website. Here are a few examples of how our programs are making a measurable impact. First, New Yorkers are getting help right when they need it. NYC Well, the city's free 24 seven helpline for mental health and substance use issues has responded to more than 1.3 million calls, texts and chats since 2016. People call for crisis counseling, referrals to providers or urgent care for, from a mobile crisis team. Over 93% of callers consistently say they are satisfied with NYC Well services. Second, Victims of crime are feeling safer because we recognize that crime can have a serious impact on victims' mental health. We launched the Crime Victim Assistance Program or CVAP, which places Safe Horizon advocates in every police precinct and police service area citywide. CVAP advocates have served over 200,000 New Yorkers through supportive counseling, safety planning, referrals to legal and social services, and assistance applying for victim compensation. Last year, almost 95% of people surveyed reported feeling safer emotionally and or physically after receiving assistance from a CVAP advocate. Third, older New Yorkers are seeing improvements in depression. In partnership with the Department for the Aging, we have added clinicians to 46 senior centers across the city. These clinicians have screened over 3,600 older New Yorkers for a variety of mental health needs and provided more than 38,000 therapy sessions. Therapy helped. 
In the most recent reporting period, almost 55% of older adults experienced a clinically significant improvement in depression after three months of treatment. Fourth example, more New Yorkers with serious mental illness are staying connected to care. Around 90% of people served by intensive mobile treatment teams, people previously disconnected from care, remain in treatment consistently for at least 12 months, a remarkable success given their history. All of these initiatives are now part of our dynamic portfolio. Here's how it works. When a strategy or program has achieved proof of concept, it becomes fully integrated into the functions of the implementing agency. Several initiatives have already gone through this process. Another way we eliminate barriers to care for underserved populations is through partnerships with the nonprofit and private sectors. For example, we have provided technical assistance, training and support to MTA employees who needed to know how to identify and respond to people in need, to over 400 faith leaders who wanted training on trauma and grief, and to people working in the nightlife and creative sectors who wanted mental health support. We've also embedded mental health resources into key locations, including public libraries, private sector and nonprofit workplaces, and NYCHA cornerstone community centers. The second core function of our office is to provide strategic policy guidance and interagency coordination to improve the mental health of New Yorkers. This work, critical to ensuring an all government approach to promoting mental health, is needed now more than ever. Let me give you a few examples. This year, we convened four agencies, H&H, FDNY, NYPD, and DOHMH, to bring emergency mental health care to people wherever they are, in their homes or in public places, for the first time in New York City's history. Be Heard, our new health-only mental health emergency response, is currently operating across five precincts in Upper Manhattan, where social workers and EMTs respond together to mental health 911 calls. The Be Heard response has already reduced unnecessary hospitalizations and unnecessary use of police resources. For example, in the first three months, 43% of people served by Be Heard were assisted on site or transported to community-based care, options not available ever before. A cross-agency collaboration of this complexity requires the high-level leadership that a mayoral office can provide. Recently, we initiated new cross-agency work to prevent 911 mental health emergencies. About 300 people call 911 more than three times a month. That's a tiny fraction of 1% of our city, accounting for 6% of mental health emergencies. We believe these people could be getting more effective care, care that might prevent these costly emergency interventions. That's why the FDNY and the health department are now beginning to connect frequent utilizers of 911 to teams of peers and social workers to engage them in ongoing care. More than anything, this initiative required a simple shift in how agencies do business, one that we believe will have long-term positive impact. It likely would not have happened without the coordination function of a mayoral office. We also have a more formalized coordination role through the Mental Health Council, first created by Executive Order 15 and convened by our office. Over 30 city agencies across government come together regularly to share best practices, request information, and collaborate to create an all government approach to mental health. Over recent years, the Mental Health Council discussions have led to developments of resource guides for vulnerable populations embedding mental health screening and referrals into emergency food delivery during the pandemic, and new strategies to prevent vicarious trauma among frontline city workers. Intro 2442 would incorporate the Mental Health Council into the charter with the Mayor's Office of Community Mental Health continuing to serve as the convener. New York City has done something that no other large city has done. We have made mental health a priority for city government. With Mayor de Blasio and First Lady Shirlane McRae's leadership, we started an unprecedented conversation about mental health that is having a lasting impact. But we didn't stop there. We have significantly expanded support for people with serious mental illness, 
strengthened our response to mental health crises, and just as importantly, made investments in early intervention and prevention. All of this with a focus on mental health equity that will transform our city for years to come. We've done this intentionally with innovative solutions designed to address longstanding gaps in care. We've done this transparently with data for every single program available on our website to help the public understand the reach and impact of our work. And we've done this responsibly with careful stewardship of taxpayer dollars documented in publicly available programmatic budgets. This work must continue. In the wake of the pandemic, it must go even further to make sure every New Yorker has mental health care whenever, wherever, and however they need it. Now is the time to enshrine the city's high level commitment to mental health and the office needed to fulfill it into the charter of our city. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for your continued leadership and partnership. Thank you, Director Herman. Before we turn it over to questions, I want to um, administer the oath to Ellen Greeley, the Executive Director of Grants at the New York City Department of Veterans Services. Um, Executive Director Greeley, if you can just unmute yourself, I'm gonna administer the oath. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Okay, I guess. All right, well, we'll get back to her then, sorry. I'm gonna turn it over now to questions from Chair Lewis followed by Chair Dinowitz. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you, Chair Lewis, you may begin. Thank you so much. Uh, before I start questions, I would like to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Members Borelli and Eugene, and I'll jump right in. Um, in Thrive NYC's initial 2015 report, Thrive NYC, um, the mental health roadmap, roadmap for all, the city had pledged to invest 500,000 to create a veterans outreach team to provide additional navigation assistance and care coordination for veterans and their families. In 2019, former DVS Commissioner Sutton testified that the engagement and community services outreach team conducted a multi pronged outreach in multiple locations across the city. So I wanted to ask if um, we could get some more information regarding if the outreach team is still operational and if so, what's the team's role and responsibilities now that we've pivoted to remote due to COVID? I'm gonna turn that to DVS to respond. I will say that the outreach teams are still active while they're, I think Jason may be trying to unmute himself or Amari is trying to unmute himself, I'm not sure. But the outreach teams are still active, still engaging veterans. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> and uh, uh, just before I, I answer the question, Chair, um, and Chair Dinowitz and all council, we just, I just wanna say thank you for scheduling this hearing and helping us destigmatize the conversation about mental health. Um, so thank you all for having us and to piggyback off of Susan's response, which is accurate. Uh, that funding is still um, in the DVS budget. That staff is still performing the roles and responsibilities associated with uh, supporting veterans with mental health issues. But in addition to that, uh, that staff also provides support with all social determinants of health. Uh, at DVS, we recognize that mental health uh, is affected by many things. And so this staff is tasked with a variety of other services and tasks that support the conversation of mental health, while also connecting them with the appropriate stat, uh, services in our care coordination network in Book Connect. Um, some of the things that they help with is helping veterans file for disability claims. Uh, some of those disability claims are mental health related. Um, they also connect them to the organizations, as I said, in the Vet Connect network, and they also provide support services for securing permanent housing. Um, and as the commissioner mentioned, our implementation of the health screeners in our operations uh, are conducted by all of the folks that are in this line. And so thanks to OCMH, we've been able to operationalize a critical step in determining the uh, symptoms of mental health in any service request they come to us. 
So we don't necessarily only support those requesting mental health services from us. Those staff are trained to engage with people on any topic and screen them for those symptoms so that we can encourage the conversation for mental health and then use our network to connect them with them. All right, thank you. Um, and I'll direct this next question to you, Jason. In the same 2015 Thrive NYC report, the city plans to create a veterans holistic treatment fund of a million dollars that will provide grants to organizations that serve veterans and their families. Has the funding been allocated? And if so, what is the success of the treatment fund? Thank you, Chair, for that question. Since that 2015 time, we've had uh, a transition in leadership and scope of work on how we want to engage the veteran community. That, that funding is not with DVS currently, and we've since transitioned our services to be more operational and work in conjunction with our community-based organizations who offer mental health services. Um, in, the, that funding is not necessarily needed for us to deliver the services that we've worked with OCMH to help our constituents with their needs. But we also engage with many holistic health partners that we've joined uh, or recruited, I should say, to the Vet Connect network uh, that provide those holistic services uh, without that grant funding. So we still have those services available to veterans, but we didn't actually need funding to actually procure those services. And uh, in today, I should say. So Jason, if I didn't hear you correctly, where is the money? We, we do not have that, that funding currently baseline or currently in our possession. Okay, are you guys working towards obtaining it? We're always uh, exploring ways that we can work with the city on how we can expand our mental health services. But uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we've been very selective over what kind of services and financial uh, decisions we make regarding the services that we offer the city of New York during that time. So since COVID-19, we've just tried to focus on the present day and uh, what kind of services are needed immediately. So we haven't looked at that um, since the pandemic, but we are open to exploring that again as, a, as an option in the future. And we'd love to work with council to see it through. All right, so Jason, I just wanna let you know a pledge of a million dollars was made and you just stated for the record that you really don't need it because there's other ways to work around it we should find out where that money is. All right, so I'm gonna just go to the next question because I know I'll call, my colleagues have can I, can I just say that the money was never allocated to DVS. It's not a matter of, it didn't, it didn't go there and wasn't used. It never went to DVS. It was reallocated by OMB to other priorities. Thank you for sharing that on the record, Susan. So I, we have some more questions about that that we need to ask um, OMB. Um, I wanna go to alternative treatments really quickly before I, I turn over to Chair Dinowitz. I wanted to know, does the administration have a position on advocacy to legalize MDMA or psilocybin for medicinal use in treating PTSD and depression? Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll take that to begin. Uh, DVS is always open to exploring alternative treatments for PTSD and other mental health conditions. Uh, we do defer to the federal government and the FDA to make the appropriate decisions around those forms of treatment and what kind of treatment is uh, structured for our clients. Uh, we do recognize that, that uh, in general, the veteran community has advanced uh, different formulas to uh, address PTSD through a multitude of alternative treatments. Uh, we just wanna be careful um, on what we share with our constituents and uh, how we share that, that treatment. Um, as you know, you know, the veteran community, we want to make sure that we're not uh, providing any substances that become an addictive uh, substance for those folks. So in treatments like this, we are eager to hear more about it um, and we want to see it be successful, but we just want to carefully uh, work with our partners at OCMH and DOHMH to understand how we share those resources and when the appropriate time is to share those resources with our community. But I will defer to DOHMH and OCMH if they have anything else to add on that. If they don't, Jason, I don't know if you have the answer to this. What are the alternative treatments that are currently uh, being utilized at the moment 
and if you if you can't share that uh, if ketamine and psilocybin is available in New York City, would your agency be open to advocating for that? Great question, Chair. Uh, I'll take the second one first. Um, that we would like to work with DOHMH and OCMH and Council on that second question on how we would like to introduce that to our veteran community. Um, so we are we are open to having meetings and discussions about it. Um, but the first question, we are working with Operational Warrior, uh, Warrior Shield uh, to uh, provide free transcendental meditation classes to veterans. Um, we also work with the Reconsolidation of Traumatic Memories Protocol uh, developed by Dr. Frank Bork at the Research and Recognition Project. Both of those I can provide you with greater details on so that uh, you in the chair and the rest of council can become more familiar with them. Uh, but those are just two examples of ways that we would like to explore different treatments for PTSD and other mental health conditions um, because we'd always like to grow and we'd always like to make sure that we're on the cutting edge of new solutions to help our constituency. Is the administration currently conducting any studies with some of the uh, medicinal use of MD, MA, and psilocybin for treating P PTSD? Has the administration thought about that? Who are I you would, asking? Sorry. Sorry, Chair. I, I will defer to the health department on, on that. Oh, it looks like Jamie's on mute. Thank you. Oh, there we go. I can speak. Hello. Um, and thank you um, for convening us, Chair uh, Lewis and Chair Dinowitz. Um, the health department does not conduct its own um, uh, research in this regard, but we are um, aware uh, that there um, is some research out there regarding the, these alternative therapies, um, and we are evaluating the literature. Um, we support, uh, you know, all evidence-based treatments uh, are always looking for new interventions to better serve New Yorkers. And so if and when they become locally and federally permissible, we will absolutely uh, support their um, optimal use here in the city by our healthcare providers uh, based on their um, conversations with each individual they're serving, right? All treatments always tailored to the needs of the individual. So I wanted to share with you, thank you so much, um, Assistant Commissioner Knuckles. Um, I wanted to share with you that uh, Denver City Council recently commissioned a year long task force and study on the potential decriminalization on psilocybin. And, and you just mentioned the federal government, but I wanted to know if the city would plan to have a task force or commission a study on a potential impact of medicinal uh, legalization of this. And that's certainly something we could explore. I'd love to learn more about the task force that you commissioned to understand um, how we could uh, build on, on that work. All right, now I'm gonna turn it to Chair Dinowitz for any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Lewis. I also want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Ayala, <coughs> pardon me, uh, and Valone. Um, one of the issues that has come up uh, repeatedly over the past number of hearings is, is the challenge of identifying our veterans. Um, pursuant to Section 7 of Executive Order 65, signed by the Mayor on March 23rd, 2021, all city agencies were required to adopt a standard and uniform veteran indicator question on their intake forms, questionnaires, or requests for assistance by the end of the fiscal year, 2021. Does DVS have an update on the progress of adopting the veteran indicator question on all city forms? Yeah, Chair, we, we continue to work with all of our city uh, agency partners to update all of their forms. Uh, we're still in that progress, but we can send you a more detailed report after this, after the hearing. Last hearing, uh, which was uh, towards the end of October, uh, we had spoken specifically about the veteran ind indicator question on the vaccination form. So that was over three weeks ago. Has any movement been made in including the veteran indicator question on the vaccination forms? As we know, more and more people are getting vaccinated, mandates, booster shots. Has, is there an update on that? Uh, we, we understand the importance of that question. 
we are working with our, our legal staff at DVS and the appropriate partners in the city to get it on there. And we'll, we'll be happy to send you an update on that uh, after the hearing as well, sir. Thank you. So, so it's, I understand things take time, but it is something that is being worked on, right? It is. Yes, sir. We are okay. we're working diligently to get, we understand the timeliness of it is also very important because of the, this period for vaccination. So we're working yes. diligently. We will get back to you on it as soon as this hearing is over. It's good news. More and more people are getting vaccinated, but that means, and as far as DVS is concerned, we're losing opportunity to identify more and more veterans. Um, so what services and support do you have that's dedicated to helping the family members of veterans and active service members? Yes, Chair, I'll pass that on to Amari, Assistant sure. Commissioner. Thank you for that question, Chair. So uh, anyone who, reach out, who reaches out to DBS um, uh, gets an, an intake performed uh, by our intake coordinator. So it really depends on the uh, type of need that they uh, communicate to us. Uh, but we, some of the examples uh, are service-connected benefits, uh, particularly uh, pension benefits and educational benefits for spouses and dependents of veterans um, through the uh, U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, we can, th there's also uh, the property tax exemption. Uh, we have some uh, family members, uh, again, especially spouses that uh, do qualify for that. Uh, through the city's department of finance, um, and again, we, we you know, it, 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 the situation dictates as far as what services that that family member uh, comes to us, uh, you know, with. And uh, if we can't, uh, you know, if we can't solve it in house, we, we make a referral to the appropriate provider in our ReConnect um, platform uh, to make the, you know, to, to get that uh, that response um, a solution to. So let me be a little more specific in the question. So it sounds like very solidly there's support for uh, financial needs. So you mentioned, you know, housing, uh, tax exemptions and pensions. I, I, it, is there anything more solid in terms of mental health support and family counseling for the family members of veterans? Is there anything specifically uh, for that community? Or is that just uh, yes. back to the general NYC well, general mental health in the city? Mari, yeah, I, I'd like to jump in here, Chair. And actually, Dr. Dr. Amanda Spray here is actually joining us for this, camp, this hearing. And she she is uh, one of our partners at the NYU Stephen Cohen uh, Military Family Center. And they specifically have programs for families uh, for uh, counseling. And uh, I'm sure she can speak to the uh, the specifics of the the programs that they have there but they're one of our best partners I'm, I'm glad they're here today chair and we'd love to you know get you involved in them more uh because i know they're doing great things with um uh, schools as well and given your background i know that you were you'd be interested in that hi amanda hello talking about the fact that i i, I was a teacher it's my uh, yeah. my previous profession um um so one of the issues that, that we contend with is, is interagency collaboration. So D Director Herman, you spoke um, you know, very generally about mental health services, all of the support, the additional supports New Yorkers have uh, been getting over the years, the help that they get when they, <clears throat> when they need it through NYC Well. M my question is, do, do those services meet the unique needs of veterans and service members and their families? Do you end up doing referrals to DBS? What is the collaboration? What is the collaboration there? So thank you for that question. Um, all of the services uh, that we offer in the city are certainly open to veterans and NYC Well um, will refer someone to services that are particularly oriented to veterans if the person identifies themselves as a veteran. Um, you can actually call NYC Well and be completely anonymous and be referred to services um, or get immediate counseling on the phone right then or have a mobile crisis team without ever saying your name. So, and we want that. We want which is, people- Which to, is good. Which is do you, good. Yeah. But, but let me say- question, do, do, you, do you affirmatively ask the question? I mean, 
We do we not do. ask, are you a veteran? We do not ask about a variety of questions. If someone identifies themselves as a veteran, which people often do, we will then refer them to services that are geared to veterans. And we have had many services. It's not just NYC Well that can refer them. That's kind of our gateway to services for mental health and substance misuse. But there are many services that we've provided from mental health first aid, which had and has a veterans oriented training to um, all of our mobile treatment teams. If someone identifies as a veteran, they will make sure that they are connected to veteran services if they desire them. I can also turn to Jamie Nichols who can talk a little bit more about NYC Well, but I would say all of our services, and I would even point to the clinicians in our senior centers, when they're working very closely and intimately with someone, if they identify as a veteran, that clinician is going to take that into account, um, work that into the therapy and or refer them to other services if appropriate. Jamie, do you so want to elaborate I, on NYC but, Well? Yeah, Sorry. well, can I just pause for one, for one second because I know you said people often do identify as veterans, but one of the challenges we're facing in our city with regard regarding providing services to veterans is the fact that people often don't identify as veterans. So there is- And, and they may not want to. They may not know to, they may not want to. I, I don't know. That's that's why I'm glad like the, these agencies are here because DVS and the conversations we have says we have trouble identifying who the veterans are. And, mm -hmm. and you're and you're saying that people are, are often identifying as veterans. So this is an important conversation to have. There's some there's some disconnect. There, there's some disconnect. And I'm 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 you know just gonna put out there that the intake forms, the questionnaires aren't only written that they're verbal mm -hmm. and uh, a veteran may not affirmatively want to say that they're a veteran on, on the phone. It's, it's already, as you know, hard enough to affirmatively call and yes. say that you have a need, a mental health need, um, you know, let alone all of the, all of the other issues you may, you may be calling about all of the needs you have as a veteran. Um, so I think that that is an important conversation the agencies need to have to address executive order 65, right? Identifying, uh, affirmatively identifying the veterans, not waiting uh, for them to come to us. Um, so let's say a veteran does call. How long does it take for DVS to respond to a veteran's online request for mental and behavioral health services? I have a question. So, uh, as with any assistance request, non emergency assistance request, uh, uh, those uh, calls or online requests are uh, responded to within two business days, no later than two business days. Okay. Um, that is across, that's standard across our Vet Connect platform. Right, and, and I assume that it's, I assume there's um, urgency placed if there's suicidal ideation identified, Absolutely. right? Okay. Yes, yes, if, if, if that comes up uh, in a conversation, there is a separate protocol uh, for that. Uh, it's a, we're, you know, they're immediately connected uh, with the staff here and uh, the referrals made appropriately, whether that be uh, NYC Well, Veterans Crisis Line, things of that, that, that nature. So I, I wanna clarify a piece of information I have. It's that I have according to DVS's website and the 311 website, veterans experiencing a mental health crisis are advised to call the VA crisis hotline uh, yeah, so that is the veterans crisis line. Okay, and that's, does the VA share data with DVS about the demographics and specific needs of the city's veterans who call the national crisis hotline seeking assistance? So if there is a referral made uh, from DVS, the, the VA and the veterans crisis line will confirm uh, that that veteran was in fact um, engaged and given assistance, however, uh, they don't give us, they don't provide any, um, any outcomes based data. So unfortunately, uh, we don't have that. Um, we're working with the VA to see if we can uh, receive uh, specific data on, on outcomes, Councilman, but at, at present time, we do not. I'm sorry. So, so you said something different than I said. I just want to clarify. You, you said referrals to the VA. Um, the, the website, the DVS and 301 website says the veterans are advised to call the VA. 
So it's just a, a, a slight difference. So the, the veteran is doing the action of calling uh, the, the VA, but they don't they don't share anything with you, right? Correct. That, that is correct. Right. Rather as referred or they make the phone call themselves. Um, we unfortunately don't receive any outcome based data. One of the Chair. issues. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Lawford. Sorry, sorry to interject, Chair. I would like to just uh, share with you that DVS is always uh, in, engaging with our partners to uh, discuss data sharing agreements. Uh, one of the reasons why Mission Vet Check was so successful was because we successfully uh, executed MOUs uh, it, for the purpose of data sharing with many of our city partners. Uh, so we are always in discussion with the VA and the New York State in trying to further our data sharing agreements so that we can capture more of that, that information that you've uh, you know, referenced many times today and that the importance of us identifying the veterans and where they're getting these services and, and who they are. Uh, we, have, we have been successful in, in data sharing agreements as it relates to doing the outreach for Mission Vet Check during the pandemic. And we are continuously pushing those data sharing agreements with those other partners like the VA so we can receive this information. So we will continue to work to get that information. But unfortunately right now, we do not have an agreement to receive that information at this time. And the services that the VA provides, are those services um, available to members who are other than honorably discharged? That, that is correct, Chair, uh, be, but it's subject to some other uh, criteria as well, um, such as if that other than um, honorable discharge uh, veteran has a disability due to service, they would have access to those services. Uh, in some cases, if they served uh, 24 months or more of active service, uh, they would have access to those services. So there are other criteria other than just their discharge title that would determine whether they have access to the variety of services that the VA offers. Well, let's, I, I, cause we've, we've had, you know, hearings on this as well as, um, your discharge status uh, you know, impacting the benefits you can receive. Of course, New York City provides those benefits to everyone, regardless of discharge status. But we're talking about the DVS's website and 311 referring people to the VA crisis hotline. And so if, you know, if someone was discharged other than honorably, and it was because they had a mental health crisis, um, and maybe they don't meet other criteria, but that's why they were discharged other than honorable, do they have access the VA crisis hotline? So, uh, on the veterans crisis um, website, it states that they're a free confidential resource that's available to anyone, even if they're not registered with the VA or enrolled in VA healthcare. Um, so we haven't had any um, feedback saying that anyone has been denied uh, services. Again, it's, it's meant as an emergency tool um, for those that are in immediate uh, need of mental health services. So. Again, we, we have no um, inclination that, that um, people being turned away. Okay, good. Uh, and this will be kind of my, my last question because I want to open it up to other council members. But Chair Lewis spoke about you know, funding and questions around funding and that there was um, a million dollars that was uh, uh, pledged but not allocated to DVS. That was, uh, I guess, to Thrive NYC. Is, is there a level of funding that would be sufficient to meet the department's goals for increasing mental health outcomes and improving, sorry, increasing mental health access and, and improving outcomes. Yeah, we, we would love to discuss that with you um, in this hearing. I don't have an answer for you right now, but we appreciate the council's support in helping us expand our services and uh, increase our efficacy as it relates to mental health. So we would, we would like to follow up with you and, and have this discussion in greater detail. Uh, oh, so would I. And, and lastly, is there any sort of estimate about how much investing in veterans' mental health would save city taxpayers in the long term? Obviously, number one is, is the physical and mental health of our veterans, but there are also dollars associated with this. So, uh, for example, if, if the city spent more on veterans mental health, would it save the city money uh, in supportive housing costs and financial assistance and other crisis, uh, costs related to crises that uh, people go through when they don't have their mental health needs addressed? 
Kara, I don't have the specific uh, number per client and, and per case, you know, because we also recognize it's probably uh, a, a case by case um, situation. But uh, we have, we, we are aware, and we've talked about this before, the, the benefits of investing in the veteran community uh, definitely uh, provides a return to the city and the taxpaying dollars because the veteran community does have greater access to federal resources. So when, anytime we can supplement um, city taxpaying dollar programs and uh, increase resources to the veteran community to access those federal resources, I think we, we end up in a net gain uh, as a city of New York. So we would love to do more analysis on that and get back to you. But just generally speaking, uh, we, we, we are always in uh, support of expanding our resources and, and trying to get veterans connected to federal programs because we know that it's a cost effective way for the city to operate. Right. And, and again, just to, you know, call back to the, some of the previous um, hearings we've had is that those federal benefits aren't available to all veterans, right? It's depend, dependent heavily as you shared uh, on, on discharge status. Um, I'd like to turn it back to um, uh, committee council, uh, Bianca Vitale, uh, for, for questions from other council members. Thank you, Chair Dinowitz. I will now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. If you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Council members, please keep your questions to three minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I have called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin. Okay, I don't see any council member questions. I'm gonna turn it back to Chair Lewis. Um, Chair Lewis, do you have any additional questions for the admin before we turn to public testimony? Yes, I do. I wanted to ask um, Director Jason, is there a uh, mental health outreach director for DVS right now? Uh, Chair, we, we do not have a, a person in our staff with that specific title. Uh, currently, uh, what we do have is Assistant Commissioner Espinal is in charge of community affairs. Mari can speak more about this, but as we referenced earlier, uh, we, we like to take a 360 degree approach to mental health and all the social determinants of it. Uh, we do have staff that are social workers uh, that have a, have a background in, help, in, in providing services and, a, and a, I, I guess a, I call it a high touch experience with clients who have mental health needs. Uh, but our services uh, are specifically tasked with trying to address that veterans needs from a 360 degree approach so that way we can, because we know that all of those things uh, benefit that individual's mental health. But I will defer to Amara to speak more specifically on uh, those services and the folks that are experts in that. Thanks, Jason. And, and thank you, Chair Lewis, for that question. Uh, again, we don't have anyone in that specific title, uh, but uh, all of our uh, public facing staff at DVS are trained um, you know, for, for all veterans benefits and resources, including mental health. Uh, we, we conduct uh, mental health assessments in our Vet Connect platform uh, to gauge levels of depression and anxiety. And uh, we have several uh, partner providers within the platform. Uh, they're also uh, culturally competent in, in treating uh, veterans mental health needs. Uh, so you know, we do our best to, to make the appropriate uh, mental health referrals for those veterans that come our way. So uh, Assistant Commissioner Espinel, your role is very high level um, at DVS. And while a mental health coordinator may not be the appropriate title for this conversation or what your agency has, there are multiple veterans tweeting me right now stating that they do not receive services when it comes to mental health because you do not have a mental health coordinator within the agency at the moment they did agree that they, we're going back and forth, we're arguing right now. They did agree that um, they do receive services for housing and food services, but not for mental health. So is that something that your agency may want to consider? Uh, we're absolutely always open to expanding our services, Chair. Um, you know, if, if, if anyone has any 
issue uh, who's a veteran or a family member of a veteran, they can they can call our number or visit our website, um, and we, we will um, welcome them and, and try to get them um, uh, the best help possible. Um, we're always trying to expand our, our outreach efforts um, again through through Mission Vet Check, uh, through doing uh, digital outreach and hopefully soon uh, in person outreach again. Um, you know, and, and just discussing the, the many services that DVS provides. Um, yeah, and yeah. Chair, I want to double down also on that. Um, we, we are, as a new agency, we spent a significant amount of time really uh, making sure that we create relationships with our uh, CBOs in New York City. We've got a phenomenal group of, of organizations throughout New York City that offer great mental health resources, specifically to the veteran community and the non-veteran community. Uh, so we spent uh, a lot of time building those relationships many of whom are here today to talk and testify around the services that they did do offer. So uh, it, as Amari said, we're always open to having the discussion about um, expanding our resources in-house, uh, but uh, in years past and, and presently today, we trust the services that our partners offer in New York City. We've got great organizations like NYU who's here today, Headstrong, um, our VA centers across the city. Uh, they all have great relationships with our care coordinators. So uh, we think of ourselves as navigators because it's, there is a, sometimes it feels almost overwhelming with how many options there are out there sometimes. So it really helps to have somebody coordinate you and help you go in the right direction. Um, so I understand that, that, that individual's, uh, I guess, perspective and I'm glad that the community out there uh, likes to see us grow. We, we like to see ourselves grow too. So I'm glad they're engaging with you and I'm, I'm glad we have this discussion, but I also encourage you to connect with us after this to connect that person with the many resources and nonprofits that are working with us. Oh, without a doubt, we'll definitely do that. I just wanna share that, you know, I'm grateful that we're able to hear about these organizations that are doing the work on the grounds, but I often think about black and brown communities like mines, um, Bed-Stuy, Brownsville, East New York, who have veteran populations, but don't have access to the same organizations that you're sharing with us here today. So I, I do hope that we can connect after this to make sure that uh, populations like mines and districts like mines, we can get access to quality care for our veterans. Um, Lastly, because I don't know if there's any other hands up, but this is my last question, but um, it appears the Denver City Council commissioned a task force and Texas recently passed a law commissioning a study on the potential psychedelic treatment for PTSD. I wanted to ask, um, and I don't know if it's appropriate for right now, but just going to go out on a whim. Uh, what can uh, DVS and OCM, OCMH uh, commit to today to ensure that we can expedite an opportunity for alternative treatments? for the veteran community in New York City? What I would say is, is for DVS is that we'd love to be a part of those conversations. Um, we would love to join those conversations and help facilitate uh, that discussion and whatever partners that we work closely with too, to bring in on it and uh, help you see it through. Um, I'll defer to Susan and OCMH for their perspective as well. When, whenever it comes to particular medications or particular approaches, um, we collaborate very closely and listen very carefully to our partners at uh, the Department of Health. And they are, as Jamie Nichols said, tracking what the FDA is doing, tracking what the federal government is saying. But we listen very carefully to the research that they conduct and what their position is. And then if there is a, a particular approach that would fill a significant need in New York City, we are very interested as an office in making sure that every New Yorker gets the care they need that's appropriate for them. So at the right time, we'd be absolutely open to those conversations. Thank you. And I hope we don't wait on the federal government. I think we're uh, progressive enough to start the process, but I look forward to working with all of your agencies, including DOHMH on this. Um, I wanted to, in regards to intro 2442, I wanted to quickly ask, what's the current headcount and budget for the Office of Community of Mental Health? Uh, it's about 23 and it's 2.5 million. Okay. Will this legislation require any additional headcount? No, 
Okay. okay. And uh, for the Office of Community of Mental Health um, with OMB, uh, do you plan on asking for anything in the, in the November plan? Let me, let me just clarify that we do have some vacancies, but that's our budget. Our budget is 2.5 and our, our programmatic budget changes. It's very dynamic as I described in the testimony as, as programs get proof of concept, they are um, fully integrated into their agency. So that part of our program will always be changing from plan to plan, but the, our office itself is very small. It's a $2.5 million budget and we do not plan to be asking for more funding for the office itself in the November plan. Got it. Um, that's it, that's all I have for 2442. I did see earlier council member Ayala on, but she probably jumped off by now. Um, sure. Is she back? No, no, Chair, I'd like to just think about oh. something. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry. I just wanted to uh, uh, have our Director of Grants Administration, Ellen really talk about crisis intercept mapping. In reference to uh, your district, uh, we do foresee that we're gonna be putting together a collaborative team uh, to conduct our crisis intercept mapping work. And we'd love for you to learn about it because uh, we definitely want to address the concerns you brought to us today. So Ellen, I'll, can you please share a little bit on crisis intercept mapping and um, then our next steps? Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me. We're, I'm at the warehouse and we're packing our thousand turkeys as we speak. Um, <laughs> Sorry to interject, Ellen. Can I just give you administer the oath because sure, you were not sure. on? I know that you're yep. doing an amazing job packing all the yep. um, holiday food. So I'm just going to administer the oath um, quickly to you. Do you? Um, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee today and to respond honestly to committee questions? Yes. Yes, I do. Great. Thanks. So, thank, thank you very much. Proceed. Yep. So um, beginning in uh, February 2020, our uh, colleagues through Policy Research Associates were, were hired by SAMHSA, the U.S. Uh, SAMHSA and the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs for us to... Um, participate in an exercise called crisis uh, management mapping. And we began this in Staten Island. We were able to um, identify um, medical centers, uh, VAs, as well as um, behavioral health um, centers and community organizations, bringing them all together to identify gaps in the crisis health um, system. Uh, and in, in, in doing so, uh, issues about asking whether people are veterans, whether uh, they uh, there's any type of peer-to-peer um, -peer support, uh, whether there is any uh, involvement with um, uh, uh, lethal safety planning. We've really developed these working group sessions um, and it's been very successful. We've grown from 40 organizations. We again uh, replicated this exercise in Queens. Uh, and um, we were just asked again from SAMHSA for us to do this, to conduct this in Brooklyn. So we will be identifying again, I, I've already identified about 11 or 12 different medical centers in Brooklyn um, and working towards identifying, you know, some of the ma major uh, community organizations uh, that do uh, mental health services in Brooklyn, uh, as well as uh, behavioral um, health organizations. Thank you, Ellen. Okay. So Chair, Chair, okay. we would love to get your support in getting the right folks to that table and uh, making the, these underinvested communities a, a top priority of ours to, to address. Definitely look forward to partnering with you all on that. I'm gonna um, yield to our committee council. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Lewis. Chair, do you, know it's, uh, do you have any additional questions for the admin uh, panel before we move on to public testimony? Yes, two. Uh, I heard Brooklyn a lot. I didn't hear Bronx. Director Greeley. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, so the Bronx would be up next after, after Brooklyn, assuming that um, we do get the support from SAMHSA in order to do that. And Manhattan after that, yes. 
the Bronx luckily has the VA, which is, uh, you know, as well as Brooklyn, but uh, Bronx has the VA, which is a very robust medical center. Yes, but as, as I think I mentioned in my opening statement, there are a lot of veterans who either don't qualify for the VA or rely more on community-based Yes, and, they do. Um, and, you know, and, the, and the city for various reasons. Um, right. So I, I hope that you retain that commitment to ensure um, that veterans in the Bronx are also getting what they need. Just regarding 2442, um, so in, in just reading the text, it says that the, the, there's a council, a mental health council to advise the Office of Community Mental Health on issues relating to mental health. Um, and it says um, the mental health council shall consist of delegates of any office or agency. The director determines the participation of which would aid the office's effort. So given the unique and dire need of mental health um, support and services in our veterans community, uh, what guarantees or assurances exist that a veteran or someone from DVS would be included in that council? So the, the Mental Health Council has met quarterly for the last several years, and DVS has always been a part of it. I can't imagine that that won't continue. For legislative purposes, um, I think the, the drafters felt that they shouldn't list all 30 agencies that have been a part of it, but we will certainly um, encourage that to continue to be the practice. We've had agencies that are sort of the more obvious mental health care providers and agencies who work with people who have particular mental health challenges. It's been quite an all hands on deck, all government effort. And DVS has been at, at you know, right there with us. I, I, I appreciate that, that and that historically DVS has been included. Um, of course, the, uh, you know, trust us, we've been doing it. So we're gonna keep doing it. Um, you know, isn't exactly, <laughs> you know, the best. Um, it, it would be, you know, I think important to specifically include this very high needs um, community as was referenced for, for various reasons. Uh, and just kind of going back to what Director Greeley um, was talking about, um, are there any assurances that all boroughs, including the Bronx, will be represented on the council? So the council is uh, represented currently, it consists of city agencies. There are 30 city agencies. Mm -hmm. And that includes um, all, all boroughs, all everybody in the city is represented by these city agencies. I'm not sure what you mean when you say, will, will the Bronx be represented? What I mean is it's, it's very, given, given the text, I'm asking as a, as a question because of the way the text is written, it could very well be the director determines that, you know, five people from Manhattan, five, there are only five agencies and the, and the directors of which are the borough directors of Manhattan are on the board and they don't include DVS and they don't include, um, you know, borough directors of or people who live in the, in, in the Bronx or Brooklyn. We'd be uh, happy to work with council if you'd like to work on specifying who the agencies, which agencies should be there. We have a list of the 30 agencies that have been members yeah. of the Mental Health Council, and I think you'd be pleased with who they are. I'd, I'd, love, I'd love to see that list, and I'd, I'd love to do anything I can to ensure that there's as much inclusivity geographically um, and with, with different populations, both veteran population and, of course, you know, racial, ethnic populations, right? Getting as, as much diversity and representation as possible. So uh, I think maybe I could just step back a bit and clarify. There's a difference between the Mental Health Council, which is all city agencies, mayoral agencies, that's how it has existed, and an advisory group. The Office of Community Mental Health has worked with many advisory groups. The Crisis Prevention Response Task Force had about 80 um, entities on it, community-based organizations, elected leaders, geographic representation, advocates, academics, all represented. And I think that's more what you're talking about. We also have a advisory group for the Be Heard program, but the Mental Health Council itself is um, city government agencies. 
I understand. But we'd but be happy you to... also, yeah, no, no, please. I'd like to continue this conversation and, and get that list because, as you heard Chair Lewis also articulate, you know, communities of color um, are also not the needs are not being met. We are obviously here because so many needs of veterans are not being met. And so, you know, that's why I'm looking forward to future conversations to make sure that there's representation. Not, I, I, I'm glad there's advisory councils that are diverse, but I'm, um, you know, want to make sure that this council, the mental health council, is also representative of the great diversity that exists within our city. And, and right now, what I'm hearing is that, what I'm hearing is, I'll get your list, trust us. You know, maybe the maybe the council it doesn't have everything it does now, but maybe in the future it doesn't. But we talk to other people, so it's fine. No, that, and so that's all I'm at. That's all I'm asking, and that's what I'd like to work with you on to ensure that the various groups and 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 needs are met. Happy to work with you. Thank you. We'll turn it back to committee council. Thank you, Chair Lewis. Thank you. We have concluded administration testimony and will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. For panelists, after I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. There may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the, ra the raise hand function in Zoom. I will call on you after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you raise your hand. I would like to now welcome to testify uh, Derek Coy. After Derek Coy, I will be calling on Matthew Ribba. After Matthew, I will be calling on Dr. Amanda Spray. And last, I'll be calling on Jesse Gold. Time starts now. Derek Coy, you may begin. Good morning, Chairperson Lewis, Chairperson Dinowitz, and distinguished members of the Committee on Veterans and Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. My name is Derek Coy, and as a former Sergeant in the United States Marine Corps and veteran of the Iraq War, I appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony on behalf of the New York State Health Foundation, NYS Health, Focus on mental health services for veterans in response to COVID-19. And West Health is a private, independent foundation that works to improve the health of all New Yorkers, including the roughly 700,000 veterans who call New York home. Our work to improve veterans' health not only provides us with in-depth knowledge of the mental health challenges veterans face, but also interventions that improve their well-being and barriers that prevent access to care. You can learn more about our work at our website at nyshealth.org. As you all know, most veterans transition into civilian life relatively smoothly, but for some like myself, the adjustment is not as easy. Many struggle with physical injuries in addition to the invisible wounds of war, such as post-traumatic stress disorder. Veterans in New York were already experiencing unique mental health challenges before the pandemic and were more likely than their civilian counterparts to experience depression, substance abuse, PTS, and death by suicide. The pandemic has exacerbated these issues and increased by increasing isolation, food insecurity, economic hardship, worsening mental health, and a lack of access to mental health services. To address the mental health challenges faced by veterans in New York City, NYS Health has invested in numerous programs focused on identifying and stabilizing veterans at highest risk of dying by suicide, expanding high quality mental health care, and conducting outreach to ensure veterans in need have access to a variety of resources that can alleviate and prevent future mental health challenges. For instance, we helped Stop Soldier Suicide expand their flagship Disrupt Military Suicide Program into all five boroughs, which rapidly identifies those at greatest risk of suicide using cutting edge marketing and client acquisition techniques and connects them to comprehensive services based on their unique physical and mental health needs. For those in need of mental health care, but might not necessarily be in crisis or family members of a veteran, you'll hear more from the amazing organization that's the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Center at NYU, which we were proud to invest in. They provide free high quality telemental health services to veterans and their families. And thanks to the expansion of their services and increased presence in new markets, they have seen a 50% increase in client intakes compared to pre-pandemic. And finally, we supported the ongoing efforts that you all are pretty familiar with, that of Mission Vet Check, which is the unique partnership between New York City's Department of Veteran Services, the Mayor's Office of Community Mental Health, 
and New York Cares. This collaboration has led to approximately 20,000 outreach calls each year that provide the opportunity to connect with veterans in need, to provide services that they need, and also reducing social isolation. We have a lot more uh, information about this in our written testimony, which I highly recommend you all checking out if you have the chance. Addressing unmet mental health needs of veterans and providing high quality treatment, both in and out of the clinical environment, requires a community-based approach that engages a variety of diverse stakeholders. And that's what has happened in city. An exceptional coalition of public and private providers has stepped up to increase both the services they provide in addition to the target outreach required to identify veterans in need of services during the pandemic and NYS Health has been honored to support these efforts. We appreciate the committee's attention to these important issues and we look forward to continuing our partnership with the city and other like-minded organizations working to ensure veterans have access to the care they have earned. Thank you all. Thank you, Derek. Matthew Ribe, you may begin after the Sergeant at Arms starts the time. Time starts now. Uh, good morning, Chair Lewis, Chair Genowitz, uh, Council Members, Veterans and Advocates. My name is Matthew Reba. I am the Director of Community Outreach at New York Presbyterian's Military Family Wellness Center. Uh, I am also a combat veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, with 10 years in service and six deployments. I had uh, originally prepared a written statement, which I had submitted, and I encourage you all to take a look at. There's some good information in it, along with uh, some of our peer-reviewed research from Columbia University that I think is important. Um, but given the way the conversation has gone today, there's a couple of key points I think I would like to uh, mention some comments on. Uh, I want to first appreciate some of the information that was cited from the RAND reports early on. Um, I think that is very important to point out, but it's also important to point out that a lot of the information that was being relayed is more than a decade old, uh, and that doesn't really suit the current situation here in New York. I would like to offer, uh, we have had several papers that have been published from Columbia University over the last year on topics regarding uh, in psychiatric journals and academic journals and medical journals on topics regarding veteran uh, mental health with COVID, the use of telemental health in New York City um, during the treatment of COVID, our dropout rates from our veteran mental health clinic, uh, which we found a 24% attrition rate of people who started services that did not complete services, which is extremely low compared to the average of most veteran clinics that see dropout rates anywhere between 36% and 68%. Um, additionally, we released three papers. Uh, this is regarding alternative treatments on our equine program for PTSD, which was the first standardized manualized nation, or excuse me, uh, academic study that was done for PTSD uh, using horse therapy. Um, and then on some of the other topics that Chair Lewis had brought up regarding psychedelic medicines, I just wanna make you all aware that there are there is research currently being done in New York City uh, at the Yehuda Lab at the Bronx VA, as well as uh, some of my partners at Columbia who are researching ketamine treatments. So these wheels are already in motion and I would encourage anybody to reach out I'd be happy to sit down with uh, our government advocates as well and discuss some of the therapies that are currently going on uh, in New York. I also just wanted to point out, uh, as far as referrals are concerned, that both of our clinics at Wild Cornell and at Columbia, uh, branded with New York Presbyterian, have been operational and for over seven years. Uh, we've been on the DVS referral platform for three years. In the first two years that we were on those platforms, when Northwell Health was running the call center, we received a huge amount of referrals. Uh, I think 50 plus patients that ended up coming into services for us. Although I have to say over the last year, uh, I, that has dropped to zero. I haven't received any referrals from the DBS office. Um, I'm not sure if that's due to personal turnover or just uh, screening practices. Um, but I did wanna point out that we are available to help but have not been receiving any referrals. I'm expired. I had a couple of other comments, but my time is up. Uh, I apologize and uh, thank you for hearing me. I'll be uh, able to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Matthew. I will now call on Dr. Amanda Spray. You may begin and when the time starts. Time starts now. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Dinowitz, Chair Lewis, and members of the New York City Council Committees on Veterans and Mental Health Disabilities and Addiction. I'm Dr. Amanda Spray, clinical psychologist and director of the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Center at NYU Langone Health. We deeply appreciate the committees for holding this hearing today, as it's a crucial time for the mental health of our city's veterans and their families. Not only does the COVID-19 pandemic continue, but this year has also brought the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terror attacks and the withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan. 
Veterans are facing significant stressors that can threaten their mental health. It's essential that we ensure our veterans have access to high quality evidence-based care at the time they need it the most. The Military Family Center was established over nine years ago in July, 2012, with the goal to fill gaps in mental health care services available to veterans and their families in the New York City area. The center's mission is to address the mental health challenges of this population by providing accessible, high quality, evidence-based treatment to veterans and their family members. We strive to remove barriers to care through a number of ways by providing our services completely free of charge, offering our services to veterans regardless of their discharge status, combat exposure, or era served, opening our services not only to veterans, but their family members who we define very broadly, making appointments available outside of business hours to accommodate our patients' academic or employment pursuits, and offering our services not only face-to-face, -face, but through a telehealth platform to anyone in New York State, which has been particularly essential during the pandemic. Veterans and their family members are seeking mental health services at a higher rate this year than they were at this time last year. Our center has observed an 170% increase in individuals calling our intake line for services thus far in 2021. This sharp increase has resulted in struggles to meet the demand and ultimately a wait list for services. Additionally, we've observed that veterans and their family members are presenting with higher rates of depressive disorder, substance use disorders, and relationship distress diagnoses this year as compared to last. We provide evidence-based treatments for these diagnoses, including substance abuse disorders, an area that is often siloed from mental health services and can render someone ineligible for mental health care. We've also experienced student veterans struggling with online learning and seeking an evaluation to determine the nature of their challenges and our recommendations on how to address these difficulties in order to remain enrolled in school. Our center is also uniquely equipped to assist with these difficulties, often caused by traumatic brain injury, PTSD, and longstanding ADHD that may have been previously undiagnosed. As described, we're experiencing an increased need for mental health services by veterans and their family members in recent months. These veterans deserve the gold standard mental health care and to not have further barriers presented to them as they seek to address their mental health challenges. Our center is equipped to work together with the community to address the ever-growing needs of veterans and their families. We hope the council will further invest in the veteran population to ensure that we are not leaving anyone behind. Time Thank you expired. again for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Dr. Amanda Spray. I'm now going to call on Jesse Gold. You may begin when the Sergeant at Arms starts the time. Time starts now. One second, Jesse, can you hear me? You're on mute. I know that you are um, called, like logged in with audio, but you are on mute. I ask that you unmute yourself so you can provide testimony. Hi, uh, this is Jesse Gould. I am the founder of Heroic Hearts Project, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we've been operational for about five years. I myself am an army ranger, uh, was a sergeant, uh, multiple combat deployments to Afghanistan. I've seen both firsthand, uh, struggles with mental health, as well as many of my uh, fellow service members who uh, continue to struggle or unfortunately have lost the battle. Um, through Heroic Hearts, we have been essentially on the front line of this, uh, using psychedelic modalities to heal veterans with PTSD, traumatic brain injury, all sorts of other ailments coming from trauma from war. Um, and in that time, the reason why uh, it's become more popular, fortunately, the research has backed it up been seeing amazing uh, institutions like um, Johns Hopkins, Stanford, NYU, all doing research to support this um, because it's effective. And so if you see across the board, whether it's MDMA, ketamine therapy, what we're seeing with psilocybin, the results are well above and beyond anything that we've been using for mental health before. And the writing on the wall is that these are here to stay and they're just going to become more prominent. And so what we have been advocating both here in New York and across the country is that we accept this reality and we make the changes within the state, within a broader perspective so that we are prepared for this because through Heroic Hearts Project work, we have veterans in mass coming to us. And the majority of these veterans have been through the VA system for 10 plus years, all sorts of medication, all sorts of talk therapy to limited avail. And at this point, even though we are a small nonprofit, we have over 800 veterans waiting for our services 
of connecting them to evidence-based psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. Um, and we need the help of uh, organizations and statewide initiatives like New York uh, to help us deal with this ongoing problem. Fortunately, we do have um, movement like within the Bronx VA, Dr. Rachel Yehuda, uh, but it, it's not enough. We need to train practitioners. We need to have better understanding of all of this. Um, it is working. The writing on the wall is that this is going to be here to stay, and it is the most uh, effective forms of treatment, but we do need to have sort of a community-based system to support what's going on uh, for the increasing demand. And as this gets more into the news media, as the research comes out, veterans are seeking this more and more. And so when there's not support there, we get this bottleneck and it actually causes a worse situation because they're going to seek it out for themselves. And that's what I like to emphasize for anybody that's listening. This is happening right now. Veterans are seeking this, whether in the underground or through programs like Heroic Hearts. Um, and they're just not being supported in that Time pursuit expired. because no matter what, they are dealing with this and they will figure out ways to solve their mental health. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having my testimony. Uh, open to answering any questions. Thank you, Jesse. I will now turn it over to Chair Lewis for questions for the public panel, if you have any. Chair Lewis? Chair, do you know what, do you have any, oh, Chair Lewis, there you are, sorry, <laughs> I didn't know. Um, if you have any questions for this panel. Do you have any questions for this panel, Chair Lewis? No? No questions. Okay, sorry about that. All right, thank you. Uh, Chair, do you, know what, do you have any questions for this panel? Yes, uh, well, first, Dr. Spray, thank you for the work you do for our veterans and our families, and of course, um, uh, Mr. Coy, Mr. Gould, Mr. Reba, thank you for the work you do, of course, for your service. Um, I just want to take it back for a second to, to something uh, Chair Lewis was asking about um, for, for uh, a DVS, which is psychedelics and, and the use of psychedelic modalities in the treatment of our veterans. Uh, Mr. Lawford, you said um, that it is, it's really a question for, for Jesse, but I just want to remind everyone, it sounded like you said that's not really something DVS or the city is exploring uh, but, but Mr. Gould, you said that that is something you are um, engaged with and helping people. So, so what interactions, if any, do you have with DVS and city government um, in, in working with them at, at all or sharing about the successes of your, of your program? Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, we, we are here to try to push it forward. It's just the question of receptability. Um, so on our side, we kind of do it more on the local level and then sort of coordinate kind of more on the, the VA side with Dr. Rachel Yehuda. Uh, I have not personally had interaction with DVS, but more than open to doing that. Um, on the local level, in terms of New York veterans, which is where I'm located, there are resources like ketamine assisted psychotherapy is uh, a viable sort of practice. The rest of them, we do more advocacy to push it forward and research uh, and working with those organizations. So we're definitely open to that, but it, there is the overcoming of having that receptiveness in terms of those who will work with us, listen to some of this messages, because it is relatively new in terms of the acceptance and, and, and this pushing forward. So that's sort of those stigmas we're trying to break right now. Well, Jesse, I'll, I'll tell you that as you were uh, testifying, I did go to your website and filled out a, a contact us page. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, please contact me. Um, we'd love to talk. Uh, and, and you know, of course, of course, we've uh, identified some of the barriers. I think that we see at the city side that might um, not. I don't want to say interfere with us being involved or helping you facilitate the uh, the progress you're already making. But we are always open to discussing uh, new ways to treat our veterans. And uh, as the chair mentioned, you know, we. We should be at the table with you guys and we should be learning about your successes and we're eager to do that so please reach out to us definitely well thank you so much i feel like we made a nice chitter here um the the for, for the uh, the any of the advocates here i'm interested just to know your experiences with um with dvs and with referrals if they exist and and just some of the um I, well, I guess one one of your experience with uh, interacting 
with the with the city agencies and some of the holes or areas for improvement that you see that we can do to work together to make sure that our vets experiencing mental health needs, uh, are, to make sure that their needs are met. I can begin on that one. Thank you, um, we've had a very We've had a very positive experience working with the city agencies, particularly DBS, um, very collaboratively, a, a great experience, a great relationship. I will say in terms of referrals, we've had you know ups and downs, a lot of different things have been tried. Um, currently the, the Vet Connect platform, we're having some difficulties. Um, I think there's still some room to hone those referrals, to make sure that those referrals are going to the right place. Um, I've also seen a decrease in, in referrals in, in the last um, nine months for sure. Um, so that's that's of note, but I know that uh, DVS has been very receptive to that feedback, which we've provided. Um, so I'm hopeful that that can improve moving forward. So sorry, Matthew uh, Reinba also said that he's seen no, and I wasn't sure if it was referrals from DVS or just no outreach. It, um, it was it, from the, uh, the Unitas platform, chair. Sure. From the, the what uh, platform? The Unite Us Vet uh, Connects platform. We had a very good relationship and we're receiving a lot of referrals from that early on in its uh, early days. And I know it's gone through some rebranding and people have been shifted around. So maybe it kind of got lost in that, but similar to what Dr. Spray had mentioned, the last nine months to a year, we've seen virtually no uh, referrals coming from the DBS office for mental health referrals. Is there, um, I mean, I, I, I can only imagine the needs have increased, not, not decreased. So what's, so, there's certainly been no slow of veterans seeking treatment. Right, uh, right. And, and, and I think, you know, it was mentioned earlier that perhaps having somebody who is a designated mental health coordinator who's familiar with the veteran specific issues, not to quote another RAND paper, but the 2018 paper, Ready or Not, clearly identified that less than 3% of providers in New York are actually set up to deal with veteran issues. So it's my belief and of many of my colleagues uh, that we should be asking anybody who does call NYC well or any of the city platforms, have you ever served in the military? Because that opens the door to a whole nother host of physical and mental ailments, right. uh, possibilities to, in order to get them on the right track to the services that they need. And then from there, it's just good screening. If we had somebody uh, designated as a mental health screener who knew the issues, who knew how to talk to veterans about those issues and was able to get them to the resources that they required, I think it would move a lot smoother. I as um, I'll chime in here to kind of field some of these questions or comments in relation to the changes that have occurred. And uh, I'll probably pass it on to my colleague, uh, uh, Amari, as well, just to, to chime in. But I will say, uh, big picture, there has been a change in the care coordination, as Matthew referenced. Uh, DBS inherited the care coordination work. Um, and Chair, we can go into greater detail with this with you on this, if, if you ever like to hear more about the history of VetConnect. Um, but it's in that transition, one of the functions that we inherited that the, um, the platform didn't have previously is a uh, multiple referral process. And uh, as new care coordinators, uh, that what that process does is that it allows for our staff to uh, send the referral out to multiple providers that we feel are a good fit for that candidate and then the provider that accepts that referral first, um, it retracts the referrals for all the other providers that were sent to. This was a new function that uh, came when we actually inherited the software. So uh, given this feedback today, we're gonna take another look at how that's working because equity is really important to us. Uh, equity has been a very important topic to us when we inherited VetConnect, uh, when we analyzed VetConnect of the past as well. So Matt and Amanda, they, you know, they might've been one of the better providers that received a higher quantity of folks. And then we'd hear from other organizations that uh, they weren't he hearing from them. So I think one of the challenges that we've had, especially in New York City, is that there is an abundance of resources out there. And we do want to be mindful of equity. Uh, but as Matthew said, I think what we really want to get to is reach a point where we have that, um, we get that to the right organization. And, uh, you know, I'll be honest with you guys here. I don't know all of the details in every mental health provider that's on the network. Our care coordination center can speak more to that and assistant commissioner can probably do that as well. But this is something that we want to continue to build on. So we're very happy that you guys shared with this, this information today because now we have an opportunity to make a change on it. Um, Amari, I'll, I'll let you also chime in if you have anything to add there. 
And I, I thank you uh, put it well there, Jason. Um, thank you to all the uh, community partners uh, for raising that concern. Um, as Jason mentioned, uh, there is uh, an algorithm within the VetConnect platform uh, that brings up uh, certain providers, uh, you know, based off of the assistance request. Um, so uh, we will certainly look into that uh, further. Again, we want to make sure that uh, all of our providers are receiving an adequate uh, amount of referrals. So uh, again, thank you for bringing that up and, and you know, we'll have to follow up in the future soon. Yeah, and, and just to highlight, at, at least from, from my perspective, it's not just about making sure that Dr. Spray and, and Matthew get referrals. It's that the veterans are actually getting getting the services. You know, that that's kind of the first concern I have. And I guess part of ensuring that is equitably distributing the the, the referrals, but that's that's my number one concern. So if that's also part of the, you know, looking at the algorithm that, that you got there, making sure the veterans are actually being connected, um, because we all want the same thing. We want to make sure our veterans, that the needs of our veterans and mental health needs of our veterans are met. So I'm really glad that this conversation's uh, occurring. Uh, Derek, I, I see your hands up. As well. yeah, thank you, Chair. Just want to chime in really quickly. What folks have said we at the foundation, a point of pride of ours, is we talk about populations. We talk with populations, and that's what led to our commission report to understand what community community providers' readiness was. And similarly, one of the issues we have, DVS has been an excellent partner since day one. Um, specifically, Commissioner Hendon, uh, Cassandra, and Ellen have been phenomenal partners of ours, and I uh, love working with them. One issue that we have, though is that veterans more often than not um, just have personal references. So if someone reaches out to me and is looking for a mental health provider, I would prefer just to email Dr. Spray because I know she's amazing, they do great work and make the connection there. So I think the Vet Connect platform, from what I've heard and talking to other vets that have uh, used it or, or been around it, it's just hard to add that extra step when a lot of folks just prefer the warm handoff or the connection to someone that they know personally. And then I think the issue with that is we would love to say how many folks are getting referred to where, what their demographics are, how many folks, uh, similarly in, in my uh, borough of the Bronx, where the needs are so we can address those needs. And I think that's the issue that we have. We'd love to know all that information so we can you know fill gaps or replicate what's working and that's probably like i think literally one of the only if you want to call it criticisms i have of dvs is uh we would just love some more of that information but have had a amazing working relationship with them and and look forward to continuing the relationship and that and derek that's one of the themes um one of the challenges that you know over the past number of uh, hearings we've been trying to address you heard um I, you know i spoke about it uh, matthew spoke about it um a, about identifying the veterans, do you do you have like a uh, do you share that information with DVS? So if you've identified a veteran, does DV do you then share with DVS that you've identified a veteran in the Bronx or in, in New York City, um, and then you know convert you know conversely does DVS share with you that they've even identified vets even if you don't get a referral uh, for them. Um, I think in specific cases, um, if, if, for instance, a veteran reaches out and is looking to get connected with DVS, I would make that warm, you know, handoff and, and just email them or call someone there directly to do that. But I think as far as the exchange of information goes, um, would, you know, I'd love to be wrong, but as of right now, I think there's not a great way to share that information. Or for me, just to ask specifically, I do want to know uh, what's happening in, you know, in the Bronx in particular. Um, I think there's not a mechanism to do that. And again, we, we focus on expanding community non-VA options. So one of our partners in the Bronx in particular, Union Community Health Center, it's just easier for me to uh, call someone there. They have a veterans liaison that we help fund that position. And, and I think, again, that's just reflective of the reality in the space. Um, and, and again, that's what, what we see more often than not. I, I, would, imagine that, I would imagine that um, your, your relationships are based on the relationship you, you've worked on and happen to have. Um, which I'm sure you've worked very hard of. I, I would imagine that worked hard on. I would imagine that DVS could and should sort of be the city agency that should be connected to all of the agencies. It is is referring or even identifying the people you work with as veterans, referring those names to DVS so they can also reach out for help, for help uh, to provide help. Is that something you're interested in doing? Do you think that would help your clients? Or is that something you'd rather avoid because of because it's too difficult or because of privacy issues? 
Uh, well, we at the foundation, we, we don't have clients. We're not a service provider. We're, we're strictly a funder. So we, we wouldn't have um, like a, a group of vets that, that are requesting services. I think it's more if they had to hit a roadblock or they, they might not have got the services they wanted or just want a, a better connection. I think that's where we in the foundation in particular can come in handy. And we do kind of serve as that glue between VA city governments, state governments, and, and the private sector as well. Um, so, so unfortunately, we don't have those, uh, you know, referral, uh, you know, uh, components of our work. Um, so I can't speak to that, unfortunately, Chair, sorry. Yeah, and Chair, I'll also add that I think to Derek's point, and this is feedback that we've heard uh, for some time now, and in relation to connection to care, uh, as Derek, Derek uh, provided in his example, um, you know, I think in an ideal world, we like for Unite Us, to have this function where somebody could send that referral through to Amanda's office. And because it would be our license that we're issuing, let's say Derek in this situation to send that referral, we would have tracking capabilities to you know, get eyes on that individual, that veteran who's serving in the community. Uh, but as Derek said, in a lot of ways, it's easier and, and uh, more personable in his, in his experience and just emailing Amanda and making that warm handoff and so this is something that we want to pay close attention to uh, in the next coming months and moving forward as DVS to, you know, how do we maintain uh, an awareness of the veterans who are seeking mental health uh, help in New York City, you know, uh, in relation to Derek, who's making an email, uh, while also trying to explore our United system and the efficacy of those referrals and how they're being made and how we're all engaging with one another. So it's a challenge that we're, we're eager to address, but we're, we're happy to have everybody here and you chair to help us address that challenge. Thank you. Thank you. It's, 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 you know, there seems to be a lot of different things going on all with the effort of helping our veterans, whether it's different organizations or DVS. Um, but I, I have, um, um, Bianca, I have no other questions. I don't know if chair Lewis, if she's still with us, if she has other questions. Um, Okay, um, thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, see if any council members have questions. Um, I'm gonna wait a brief moment. Again, I remind council members, if you have a particular question for a panelist, please use the, the raise hand function in Zoom at this time. I'm having a problem saying Zoom raise hand function, sorry. Okay, I don't see any hand raised. So I'm gonna now turn to our second panel of public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. After I call your, after I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. There may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted. And again, we thank you in advance for your patience. Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. I will call on you after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you raise your hand. I would like to now welcome Kimberly Moore to testify. After Kimberly, I'll be calling on Coco Calhoun, then Gary Bagley, Ashton Stewart, and last Claire Kozik. Kimberly Moore, when the time begins, you may start your testimony. Time starts now. Thank you to both the Committee on Veterans and the Committee on Mental Health, Disability and Addictions, Chairperson Dinowitz and Chairperson Lewis for the honor and privilege of testifying before you today. My name is Kimberly Moore, Director of Care Cafe at Yeshiva University's Words Wireless School of Social Work. Care Cafe is a citywide initiative that brings mental health services to vulnerable populations. Our students and faculty have pioneered a targeted model of embedding Care Cafe programs in local community institutions to provide mental health services tailored to specific constituencies, including vulnerable populations, Holocaust survivors, veterans, immigrant populations, and school-aged children. To date, we have provided these services in more than a dozen council districts and maintained the capacity to expand on our current footprint as issues arise in your respective communities. Veterans are inherently decentralized and therefore hard to reach population. The work of Care Cafe has shown that community-based mental health services in partnership with neighborhood-based nonprofits, VAs and social organizations allows vets to seek out treatment in a more neutral environment. It meets vets where they are. 
a portion of Care Cafe's funding is designated for veteran services. Care Cafe addresses topics from a holistic perspective that intentionally unites a psychoeducational perspective with an emotionally supportive message. Globally, interdisciplinary practitioners are charged with deeply examining the impact of COVID-19 across various populations. Well, how should New York City be treating veteran PTSD? Our response through providers, collective strength and expertise, not in isolation. During the pandemic, with the strong supports and partnerships with community-based organizations and student leaders, Care Cafe was able to connect with the public through the delivery of virtual content, including but not limited to peer-led and facilitated trainings and support groups. This mutual aid strategy promotes openness, reduces stigma, and normalizes one's lived experience with the goal of seeking hope and change. Creating events rooted in the arts and sciences, such as our storytelling education, Care Cafe hosted a, the Telling Project, which evokes a process of healthy self-reflection and the value of shared personal expert knowledge. Encourage the incorporation of complementary and alternative medicine techniques, such as yoga, yoga and meditation. Care Cafe organized educational events around stress management, which included education around breath work, movement, and meditation. Furthermore, in programming, implement a consistent structure for regular outreach and engagement. For example, regular mailings of handouts and trinkets to our veterans where available. For many, the reliance on the regular structure of activities provided something for our members to look forward to, and for many, the only supportive entity available for them to access. In cases where veterans are isolated, Time Care Cafe will work with partner organizations to safely engage veterans through in-person community visits and reassurance calls to provide information and support uh, to connect them to identified services. Well, there's much more to share. I'll stop my share for right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, Coco Calhoun, when the time starts, you may begin. Time starts now. Hi, I'm Coco Colhain, the uh, founder and executive director of the Veteran Advocacy Project, or VAP for short. We provide free legal services to veterans and their families. We focus on working with those who have post-traumatic stress, brain injury, and mental health conditions. Uh, VAP strongly supports introduction to 442 for the Mayor's Office of Community Health to make it permanent. Um, these are vital resources that are long overdue. However, uh, we think it's ironic that the office is being established in a joint meeting with the Veterans Committee. Um, I struggled with what to say today at the hearing, um, but the number of people who said that there are things they want to say and they can't convince me that uh, I need to make following testimony. Um, I just think there's been a lot of deflection today. DVS has no mental health staff, no health staff. Um, we are dealing with a situation where we've been at war for 20 years. It ended in a moral injury meltdown. We've just had the 20th anniversary of 9-11 attacks. Um, you know, we've had two years of a pandemic. Where population has nearly twice the suicide rate of the general population. Um, the clients that we serve have a suicide rate that is three times that. Um, you know, so the idea that this is about technology in terms of referrals. It's just, I think, really not what the issue is today. Um, and when it comes to, you know, the Office of Mental Health, Community Health, um, the website has a page for veterans and that seems to be all they have done for veterans. When you go on that page, it has a link for uh, trauma counseling that goes to a page that says, we're sorry, this page doesn't exist. Um, the other, resource they have is the Mental Health for All Roadmap in New York City. There's a veterans page again. All it has is Mission Vet Check. It's a brilliant program, but it's basically a souped up phone tree. Um, it's providing very important resources. We participated in the program. It is not mental health. It is not a mental health program. The page has a lot of logos of very impressive national foundations and institutions, nonprofits, um, none of them provide mental health services. Some of them don't even have programs within hundred miles of New York City. So these are not programs that if a veteran goes to that website, they're gonna find help. Um, I understand that a veteran can connect with DVS through Mission Vet Check, but the idea that that is a mental health program and that through you know a billion dollars or whatever we have spent, 
that that is enough for a population this vulnerable is not enough. It's really, we are failing our veterans. Um, and I know that this is not making me any friends right now, uh, giving this testimony. I make spite. And I just would like to finish by saying we have asked, you know, council members have asked for data for years on suicide numbers, on the use of health and hospital corporation, veterans. Why aren't we identifying veterans? Like we just heard that they aren't. This is outrageous. And I realize this is unpleasant, but I've been on the other end of the line when a veteran took his own life. That's much more unpleasant. This is a call for all of us to do better. And I know everyone cares and we can do it together. It's time for us to support the programs of the individuals who have just testified on the previous panel. We need to do more. Um, Bianca, can I just thank say you, one, one thing quickly before the sure. next speaker? Um, thank, thank you for sharing, Coco. And I, I just, I, I don't know if I speak to it for everyone, but you, we're not here to make friends. We're here to do what, what everyone wants to do. No offense to anyone here. No, we're here to help our veterans. And I, and I just don't want you to ever have to feel apologetic for caring. And that's what it seems like. So I just want to, you know, make sure you know we are we are all here to address an issue, not to make friends. And you should never uh, apologize for caring about our veterans. That's all, that's all I just wanted to say, Bianca. Thank you, Chair. I'm and thank you, Coco, for your testimony. I'm now going to be turning to Gary Bagley. You may begin once the Sergeant at Arms starts the timer. Time starts now. Thank you to uh, Chairperson Lewis, Chairperson Dinowitz, and other members of the Committee on Mental Health Disabilities and Addictions. I'm grateful to be here today to share about the impact of Mission Vet Check, a program that combats the effects of isolation during the pandemic. At the onset of the pandemic, direct service interfaces shut down, leaving many, uh, many of New York City's most vulnerable and disconnected at even greater risk. DVS saw the rising need to address the effects of isolation resulting in the launch of Mission Vet Check. DVS worked with New York Cares to expand the program early in May of 2020. And through our partnership with DVS, our volunteers have made over 21,000 calls to date. Our volunteers make wellness checks. And as you know, those in need of services often do not know what they have access to. Our volunteers can provide information on a variety of services, including free meals, COVID-19 test site locations, rental assistance, and mental health resources. The calls are welcomed. They average about seven and a half minutes in length. This program combats isolation. It is not a direct mental health solution. However, these calls do enable volunteers to hear when there may be mental health concerns. A crisis officer is live on all projects to ensure there's access to professional support when it is needed. Uh, for example, in two separate instances, volunteers spoke with veterans exhibiting signs of suicidal ideation. Now, to ensure the program is of the highest quality, the Office for Community and Mental Health helped structure the training for our volunteers. Further, there are biweekly meetings of DVS and New York Care staff that focus on improving the training materials through feedback and data collection. I also want to say that beyond providing veterans with critical resources, this program is also expanding New Yorkers' knowledge on the issues our veterans face. This experience also develops advocates for veterans. Mission Vet Check has helped in the face of the pandemic and can continue to provide invaluable support during recovery from the pandemic and inevitable future emergencies. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. We will now be turning to Ashton Stewart. Ashton, you may begin when the timer starts. Time starts. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Chair Dinowitz, Chair Lewis, members of the committees and fellow veteran service providers. SAGE is the country's first and largest dedicated uh, organization to improving the lives of older LGBTQ plus um, individuals. And it was founded in 1978. Sage Vets started in 2014. And I am uh, the manager of the program since 2018, and I'm honored to do so. I'm a veteran of the first Gulf War. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, your support has been instrumental in helping out many uh, lives uh, here in New York City. Um, the pandemic has certainly affected our population, just like everyone else. LGBTQ plus veterans, many of 
whom were already struggling with things like financial insecurity, food insecurity, acute social isolation, and, and exasperating health disparities. Um, all of that has increased due to COVID. Um, and a lot of them don't take advantage of veteran services, including the VA, for fear of discrimination because they served when the military was still enforcing anti-LGBT policies. Additionally, um, not all the service provider uh, services are available, um, including the VA. Um, they can't offer the home-based primary care program like they used to. It's been significantly impacted, leaving vulnerable veterans at risk. Um, earlier was talking about identifying who veterans are. That's certainly an issue that we struggle with um, because of the trust issues. Um, one of the things that we've uh, done um, and one of the saving graces is some of the, the groups here today have taken some mental health referrals. So they've transferred into uh, virtual options. Um, and the vet center has also been a really good sort of middle ground uh, for our population. It's a program of the VA, but they do not care about discharge. Um, status, whether it's honorable, dishonorable, or whatever, they don't care. You can go there for mental health support. We've been uh, sending a lot of veterans there. Um, one of the things that we've also done is uh, shifted our program to virtual options, which is helps sort of alleviate some of the social isolation issues. Um, we've grown a lot since then, and we've been able to get more people involved in our programming, which is one of the perks about virtual programming. It's not the same in-person touch that we had uh, just last week at the Veterans Day Parade. Um, Joe, who is a veteran U.S. Army and a Vietnam vet, um, he had not long ago reported feelings of isolation and de depression and, and helplessness. He marched with us, marching up Fifth Avenue with his rollator, waving to fan, uh, spectators. It was just beautiful. Um, and he was just so happy. And he thanked the United Veterans War Council and the NYPD for pulling it off. It was just a real wonderful show of unity and support for our vets. Um, but we can't get too caught up in that. It's, we're not out of the woods here. And one of the things that we're concerned about is that the vet centers and some other programs may suffer the same fate as the home-based primary care program and that they're just going to get overstretched and too exasperated and overwhelmed and uh, sooner or later uh, they're not going to be able to offer the services. Thank you. Um, I have to apologize to my panelists and to everyone here. Um, I do have to cut out in a few minutes. I'm happy to answer questions and I'll stay as long as I can. But at noon, we're doing a virtual program um, with a VA and we have representatives from all five boroughs, including Dr. Halberstam from uh, the Bronx VA, to talk about Transgender Awareness Week and some of the specialized services available to transgender and gender diverse veterans. Um, we've got over 100 people signed up for it, so I'm super excited about it. Um, but I'm really sorry, but it starts at noon and I'm telling people to, who are presenting to log in a few minutes early so I can give them the credentials. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Ashton. Have a great um, uh, event and hopefully we'll see you after this. Um, now I will be calling on Claire Kozik. Claire, you may begin when the timer starts. Time starts now. Chair Lewis, Chair Dinowitz, and distinguished members of the City Council, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I am Claire Kozik, Associate Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Coalition for Behavioral Health. The coalition represents over 100 community-based mental health and substance use providers who collectively serve over 600,000 New Yorkers annually. The COVID-19 pandemic has catalyzed and exacerbated mental health conditions and substance use disorders for hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers, and veterans were no exception. In 2020, 30% of US of suicide, sorry, in 2020, 30% of veterans reported having suicidal thoughts over a two-week period. And sadly, the number of US military suicides increased by almost 15% nationwide. New York State has a veteran suicide rate that is almost twice that of the national average. The generalized anxiety disorder has increased, particularly among veterans aged 45 to 64, with one in seven experiencing increased distress. 52% of veterans reported that their mental health declined as a result of isolation that came from social distancing. And in 2020, there was a 15% increase in veteran crisis calls nationwide. Unfortunately, the behavioral health workforce is insufficient to meet the increasing needs for mental health and substance use services. And as a result, veterans are struggling to access care. 
Prior to the pandemic, the behavioral health field experienced a workforce shortage due to low salaries and benefits across the sector. This shortage has now reached crisis levels. And while record numbers of New Yorkers are seeking help, staff have left the field for higher paying positions in other sectors, such as retail and restaurants. Our providers tell us every day of the staffing crisis they face. Nationally, 97% of mental health and substance use treatment organizations reported that it has been difficult for them to recruit staff. We have agencies with hundreds of open positions, but they have only received a few applications. Behavioral health providers are pausing new admissions, decreasing the number of clients they serve, and in some cases, closing programs entirely due to insufficient staffing. Many of our members are hesitant to take on new contracts because they do not know where they will find the staff. Veterans will not be able to access the mental health and substance use care that they need unless significant action is taken. For too long, the city has forced providers to accept contracts that provide poverty level wages. The city council should increase funding for city, city contracted mental health and substance use providers so that they can raise the wages and offer benefits for staff. There should be a living wage floor set on all city contracts as well as cost of living adjustments. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The coalition looks forward to working with the city council to ensure robust mental health and substance use services are made available to all of our veterans. Thank you so much, Claire. I will now turn it over to Chair Dinoitz for questions for this panel. You're on the guy who got noticed it. that you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Did a whole bit. Um, I, I just wanted to go back for a sec to what Coca was was talking about um, in, in her testimony about the actual services um, that DVS does and doesn't provide and the referrals that they do and do not provide. Um, because we did talk in the last panel about the the struggles or or the the change in Vet Connect that was um, resulting in problems with with referrals. I Coco, I, I was wondering if you can expand a little more. On, on, in your view, what the city is and isn't doing, and then you know, give Jason an opportunity to, um, I, I don't know, address those those concerns. Um, I mean, from what I had heard from speaking with a number of providers, that they had just stopped receiving mental health referrals, so it seemed like no one was screening. And the word was that, and it seems like it was confirmed today that Thrive had severed their relationship essentially with DVS and those outreach, mental health outreach team to become benefits uh, case manager or benefits uh, workers, which obviously social determinants of health are extremely important to mental health. But, you know, it, it seems that basically mental health has just dropped out of DVS's radar. Um, and in terms of, you know, multiple organizations getting referrals, I just don't think that we get, we have the same thing with our discharge upgrade program. We see all the referrals, even if we don't take it, it still comes to us. And what we were hearing from the previous panel is they're not seeing any at all. So it just seems like that's sort of like focusing on a technical issue that's really not what's going on. Yeah, so um, Coco, I just want to take a moment to, to second what Chair said earlier too. Um, this is a great place to, to share what the reality is of what our community is feeling. And so there, there is certainly, Nothing that can be said here that will um, make you a bad guy or whatever it is that you said earlier. Um, you are a good friend of ours. And the fact that you're just here now today, just expressing this is why you're so important to our community. Um, so on the topic of the referrals, um, contrary to the uh, testimony today from the organizations that have been working with Unitas in the past, our mental health referrals uh, went up three times the amount that they did in the period prior to us implementing the, those health assessments we talked about. So we, we do need to do some digging on our end. Uh, this was, this was a, uh, new, to, new information to us today. Uh, so we do see an increase in our mental health referrals and we're proud of that from the steps that we've taken to implement these health screeners to identify anxiety and depression. Um, it was because of OCMH that we really were able to you know, like go back to the, our health, mental health referrals to begin with and say, you know, these are, these are low numbers and we think that there's a higher need out there. And so we're, we are making progress um, 
I do believe that the that everything that was discussed today uh, introduces a new conversation about if we want to get if, if we can as an agency and if we want to and working with all the partners here to have a, a more specific um, I guess health practitioner on staff uh, we do have all of our staff trained in motivational interviewing and these health assessments so we are taking steps to get our staff uh, closer to having these more difficult conversations regardless of what the referral comes in as so uh, it is progress but uh, I as you said you know not, nothing's ever going to be good enough and for our veterans so you know I think we have to continue to uh, push the limits and addressing what is a very serious issue in veteran suicides and uh, actually make an impact. Uh, we've been talking about it for too long now and there hasn't been enough. So we're constantly trying to explore ways that we can expand on that. While I do have the group here, I do wanna say that I think there was just a discrepancy in the website and that the organizations that you were looking at earlier are our partners. They're not mental health providers. There is, is another drop down for mental health resources or resources for veterans that, uh, but you know that could be misconceived or uh, misinterpreted from our community. So maybe we can work on changing that language to ensure that these partners of ours are not mental health practitioners or mental health organizations to serve uh, those folks who did need uh, services. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. I hope I, I addressed the question. Sorry. No, I just wanted to clarify, I did not mean DVS's website, it was the Mental Health Roadmap for All. Thanks for clarifying, Coco, I'll take a look at it. And one thing, Coco, I, I, I think you touched on it, I touched on it earlier, so I just want to kind of, you know, reiterate, um, I thank you for the work you said you were doing in the, over the past couple of weeks, trying to make sure you identify veterans through the vaccination forms. I just want to reiterate how important it is um, that if someone's calling NYC well, that they are asked proactively, and you heard you heard someone else say this previously. Verbally asked if they are a veteran or if they are active military, if they've, they've served, because the needs again are, are unique and specific, and because there are different resources and different needs. So, it, it, included in the work you're doing with the vaccination forms, um, I'm, I'm urging you to do that work with OCMH as well to identify the veterans not just in written forms, but verbally as well as people do outreach to our city. Um, what, one last question that I have is, does DVS, and this is based on Claire's um, testimony, does DVS do any work or referrals, or does the city at all do any work or referrals for um, uh, referring people who are uh, who can address the, the needs of of veterans because you said there was a staffing shortage in this area. Um, so is that something DVS has heard about previously, has been able to do, or been able to refer to another city agency? Sure. So the the staffing uh, shortages that we are experiencing are with our nonprofit partners and providers. Um, we can certainly you know look into uh, working with DVS as it re relates to having staffing shortages, but just in general, the behavioral health workforce is woefully understaffed and underfunded, and that is reverberating into care not being provided to veterans. Thank you, and, and Jason? I'm sorry, Chair, my, someone came to my, do my door and my dog was barking. I'm very, I'm very sorry. Do you mind repeating? No, not at all. That's a general question, uh, you know, uh, about uh, uh, Claire had spoken about a staffing shortage in the non in, in the nonprofit world to address the unique needs of our veterans regarding mental health. I was curious if DVS or any city agency does work in addressing those staffing shortages. No, that is, that's new information for us. Um, we're certainly open to exploring how we can help address it. Uh, as Derek Coy mentioned, he, he, uh, Derek's done a phenomenal amount of work in this space and uh, working with our agencies to understand where there's gaps in these services. So uh, we would love to meet Claire, but we'll get you connected to, uh, as Derek mentioned earlier, our assistant commissioner of public private partnerships, um, Cassandra Alvarez and we could um, work creatively to figure out how we can address this issue 
in our community here in New York City. So thanks for bringing it to our attention today. Um, and I'm sure Derek would agree that he'd, he'd be supportive in, in addressing this issue. Okay, um, I'd like to turn it back over to uh, committee council. Thank you, Chair Dinowitz. I will now ask if there are any more questions from council members. As a reminder, if council members have questions for a particular panelist, they should use the raise hand function in Zoom at this time. Okay. Um, we have concluded our uh, second panel of public testimony at this time. If we have inadvertently missed anyone that has registered to testify today and has yet to have been called on, please use the Zoom raise hand function now and you will be called in the order that your hand has been raised. Okay. Seeing no one, I will now turn it over to Chair Dinowitz for closing remarks. Chair Dinowitz. Thank you, Bianca. And First, you know, thank you to our veterans and their families. Thank you to the city agencies. Thank you to all, everyone who testified today, who shared information. Thank you to the committee staff, to my staff, and thank you to everyone who's who attended and is and is watching the hearing. You know, there's there's a lot of information that I think we 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 uncovered today. A lot of connections that were made, all in the efforts of helping our veterans and their mental health needs. Our veterans who have these unique and specific needs who we know all too often are, are going unmet, whether it's psychedelic modalities or the interconnectedness of our agencies, our service providers and our and uh, or funding. We know there's a lot more work to do, but I'm, I'm glad I, I think today was a very important step in, in making those connections and bringing a lot of a lot of important information to light so we can take the next step to help our veterans who have literally laid their lives on the line, to help our veterans' families who've also sacrificed so much um, by having uh, service members in their family. I, I thank you all again. Uh, and with that, um, I will close out the meeting. Thank you.